Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Dr. Catherine Gedek Soltis, and I have the privilege of directing the Center for Peace and Justice Education at Villanova University. And since 1990, the center has annually recognized outstanding contributions to understanding and the meaning and conditions for justice and peace in human communities. Our past recipients of the award include John Sabrino, Habitat for Humanity, Sister, Sister Helen Fajam, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the Philadelphia Mural Arts Program, and the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Tonight, we have the great honor of adding Ms. Lema Bowie to this list as a recipient of the 2011 Adela Dwyer St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award. The award was made possible by a gift from the late Adela Dwyer, and we recognize Dr. Barbara Wall, who first proposed this award while director of the center, and the late Father Ray Jackson, who helped secure the gift as well as the Order of St. Augustine for its continuing support. I also want to thank the dedicated and hardworking faculty and staff of the Center for Peace and Justice Education who helped make this evening possible. Carol Anthony, Sharon Disher, Jennifer Kisco, Will Stell, <laughs> and Tim Horner. Thank you all. And sincere gratitude goes as well to the many departments and programs that have co-sponsored tonight's award the Theology and Religious Studies Department, Political Science, Sociology, the Ethics Program, Africana Studies, the Institute for Global and Interdisciplinary Studies, and Gender and Women's Studies. Many people at Villanova are very excited for this evening. Good timing has blessed us several times over as we honor Ms. Bowie tonight. Next Wednesday on September 21st, people all over the globe will be celebrating the UN International Day of Peace. So as happens at a university, you have some homework. Look for the Peace Day Philly website for projects and events happening in our community. The other bit of good timing is a five-part PBS series that will be broadcast this fall called Women, War, and Peace. Pray the Devil Back to Hell, the 2008 documentary featuring Ms. Bowie and the women of Liberia will air on October 18th. And finally, in happy timing, Ms. Bowie's book, Mighty Be Our Powers, How Sisterhood Prayer and Sex Changed a Nation at War. This book has just been published this month, and copies are available after the talk outside. But before you think we are too clever, the truth is that we knew none of this <laughs> at the time that we decided that Ms. Bowie would be offered the 2011 Peace Award. <laughs> but what we did know was that she would be an extraordinary person to teach us, inspire us, and challenge us to use our powers well in the pursuit of peace. In 2003, Ms. Bowie helped to form the Liberian Mass Action for Peace, a coalition of Christian and Muslim women who demanded that dictator Charles Taylor and rebel leaders engage in peace talks after 14 years of violence, of great violence, of killings, of rapes, of hungry children, traumatized children, all of this ravaging Liberia. So these women, impassioned, unrelenting, ingenious, these women demanded and achieved peace for Liberia, including the exile of Taylor. And I want to share with you, just for a couple of moments, a clip from the documentary, just to give you a sense and a visual of the courage and commitment of Ms. Bowie and these women. We 
going to find a strategic point where Taylor is going to encounter us and give us some attention. And this is how we decided to sit at the fish market every day. Thousands of women, including IDPs, internally displaced persons, went. It was the first time in our history in Liberia where Muslim women and Christian women were coming together. And we had a big banner that said, the women of Liberia want peace now. Ms. Bowie and the women of Liberia knew that peace would take hard work. They pressured all parties to come to peace talks, confronting them boldly with the atrocities from all sides. And at the peace talks, they barricaded the men in until they made progress on these talks. And after the accords were signed, they continued to work, to be present at the disarmament, to be there to help advocate democracy and the election of the first African woman head of state. And they were there to even be with former soldiers to promote healing. Ms. Bowie has been tireless in the pursuit of peace for her own children, and she has six, for her nation of Liberia, and for the whole of Africa. The Adela Dwyer Peace Award comes with an honorarium of $1,000 and Ms. Bowie has asked for it to go to the Kukutonum Project, which is a program that provides conflict resolution and peer mediation training to girls in Liberia. She is executive director of the Women, Peace, and Security Network for Africa, as well as Africa columnist for Newsweek and the Daily Beast. She has received numerous honors for her work, including the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award and the African Women's Development Fund Women of Substance Award. Tonight, she speaks under the title, Mighty Be Our Powers, Women Making Peace in Africa. We consider it a profound honor to be able to present her tonight with Villanova's Adela Dwyer, St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award. Thank you. Please, be, please, please be seated. Thank you very much. I will not attempt to call the name of the award. <laughs> I may disgrace myself. The first time my my own encounter with Valanova has been my basketball crazy. <laughs> yeah, this is one piece activist that is a huge basketball follower. <laughs> so the name Valanova has been ringing in my ears whenever you have the university, the college games going on. <laughs> the second encounter with Valanova, I have a daughter who's now um, at the Marymount High School in New York. And last year, she got a scholarship to come to school in New York, and she's, she they decided to do the college tour. And it's all new to me, because in Africa, where you have the money, that's where they go. No one is going to test the temperature of the college and the pulse of the instructors <laughs> and the climate of the university. Where my cash fits, that's where you're going. <laughs> So she came to Valanova, and my cousin here lives nearby, and she was excited that she's probably going to take it because it's a nice place. And this little girl comes back, and her voice is nothing like my own. And I say, how was Valanova? I don't like it. <laughs> I say, why? All of the students look depressed. <laughs> I said, well, I bet it was exams week. <laughs> I 
So before I came here, my partner who could not be with me called and say, said to me, have you been to Valanova? Do they really look depressed there? <laughs> and I said, well, I have to get there to see their faces and you don't look depressed. I think it was exams week. <laughs> Members of the faculty and staff of Valanova, student body, community members, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I bring you warm greetings from the west coast of Africa, a place I call my home. To God be the glory for this day and for his many blessings in my life. I'd like to recognize the presence of my family members here my cousin T and her three daughters, Soma, Bonye, and Piyina, and my cousin Major Thomas, they all migrated as a result of the Civil War and they are now living the American dream, whatever you call it. <laughs> <laughs> I would also like to say thank you to the faculty and committee of the Center of Justice and Peace Education for bestowing the honor on me as the 2011 recipient of this award. I gratefully accept it on behalf of myself and my compatriots, the women of Liberia in particular, and the women of West Africa in general. Today, and the gesture by this university family have reinforced my mantra, never despise humble beginnings. Never despise humble beginnings. Exactly eight years ago, tired with war, tired being used as porters and sex toys for overdrugged soldiers and child fighters, a group of us, ordinary women, mothers, daughters, decided we needed to do something to change the course of our lives in the situation of our community. We started something we had no idea where it was headed, but we called it the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. This movement was dedicated to peacefully protesting the end of the Liberian Civil War. A war that had destroyed close to 200,000 lives, created an internally displaced population of over one million, and a refugee population of 500,000. The war destroyed Liberia's economy from one of the fastest growing compared to Egypt, Indonesia, and Philippines, and doubled that of India in the late 70s to a GDP decline of 31.3% in 2003. A civil war that destroyed about 99% of Liberia's infrastructure. Children born during the conflict till this day has no idea on how to switch on a light, turn a tap, and operate a pressing iron. In 2003, The Economist reported that Liberia was an unhappy city. Famished town folks had already eaten all of their neighbor's dogs and were reduced to scourging for snails. We were in essence declared a failed state. A failed state, as you all know, is a state that has lost control over its territories and is unable to provide even the basics for its people. Liberia was at that place. The women key quest was peace. We were determined to put our already broken bodies out in harm's way and make daily demands for peace using different strategies and activities, position statements, picketing, settings, media engagement, community sensitization activities, and many more. Our demands were simple. Immediate unconditional ceasefire, dialogue between the warring parties, and the deployment of an international intervention force. Our key message, we want peace, no more war. We had no financial backing. 
We had limited access to funding for our numerous activity. We were armed with determination and passion. On days where we, were lim we had limited funds for transportation, we walked. On days where there were no water to quench our parched throats, we fasted. On days where action seemed to be getting us nowhere, our faith saw us through. By August 2003, a peace agreement has been, was signed. But I'll pause there and give a typical example of one of our days. We had no political connections. We were ordinary women who had no contacts in the government. Our only claim to, flip, to fame and political power was a Twitter sugar scooper who came from the elite American Liberian group. She decided this is a group that I want to affiliate with. So on one of the days we heard that the chief of defense staff of the different armies in West Africa were coming to Liberia and the international contact group that was responsible for negotiating a peace talks was also coming. Someone called and said to her, they were bringing women to speak. We were not invited. That morning, we decided we're going. No transportation. It was raining cats and dogs. We walked like an hour from where we sat to the center city, and then we got to where this meeting was being held, and it was barricaded by armed men. We stood there really frustrated and thinking, how did we come this far just to have nothing? And one of the girls said, there is a communications and photocopying place just down the street. Boss lady gave me a copy of our statement. Let me go and laminate, make a copy, and bring back. And I said to her, Olive, what do you think you're going to do with the statement? Say, just give me any amount. Someone give me money. And that's how we operated. Anyone with money will provide money. <laughs> she took the statement, did the lamination, came back. And as soon as the gate of the meeting place was open, she ran straight across the street. And before the soldiers could even say stop, she was in, and in the face of the Swedish ambassador. <laughs> and he was like, who are those? He was really curious to see because we had line in front of the, across the street because the soldiers told us we couldn't go close. So those are women that have been protesting the war. And then she said, I have something for you. He took the statement, thanks to the politeness of the Europeans, and said, do you have more for my colleagues? She ran across the street, got more, and I was just thinking, thank God this little girl thought about making copies. <laughs> Distributed to these men and left. After the group left, we were now standing there in the rain thinking, how do we get back? <laughs> of course we didn't have money for transportation. So we just started one jubilation, singing and dancing and walking all the way one hour back to where we came from. Those are some of the memories that we still carry as we do the little work that we do in our communities. But by 2003, a peace agreement was signed. And the peace agreement that was signed didn't come on flower bed of ease. It came through sweat, it came through tears, it came through a lot of frustration, but at the end of the day, we prevailed. We went back to a jubilating Liberia where people continues to credit us as one of the driving force for the peace we now enjoy in our country. The question we asked ourselves when we got back to Liberia, do we sit down now and allow the men to take over, resounding no. So we decided one of the first things that happened after a peace negotiation has taken place is that the document is so bulky 
and we're too busy to sit and read 365 pages. But we needed the women to know the essence of the document. So we brought together 80 community leaders, and what we, we went through a process we call demystification of the peace agreement and setting benchmarks, something that the men in Accra failed to do. So we told these community women in this agreement, one, two, three, four, five things are supposed to be happening leading to democracy. This is supposed to happen from April to December. If you don't see it happening in your community, protest. This is supposed to be happening from January to March. If you don't see it happening in your community, protest. So that was our way of tracking how the peace agreement was done. We had a situation of failed disarmament in December 2003. We stepped in, helped the UN calm the situation, and then we decided again, if we are successful in all of these things, when it comes to political engagement, we need to conscientize our women. Voters registration came, we did a survey and realized that these women, even though they had fought and advocated for peace, were not really putting themselves out to do political activities, to register, to vote. And we went to the UN and said, for one of the first times, you need to do something targeting specifically women. And they said to us, you know, um, we think they're going to come out. I went to a presentation held by the National Democratic Institute and the Republican Institute talking about the need for us to do specific activities to really conscientize women like we did during the peace process for them to register and vote. And they were like, no. Five days to the end of voters' registration, early morning, my phone rang. The UN is frantic. The American groups are frantic. Women in these 10 communities are not registering to vote. And they're explaining something that I had explained like three weeks earlier to them as, it, it was, as if it was new. This is the way donors behave. <laughs> I said to them, what do you expect us to do? And they said, well, if you can mobilize your women. We put 250 women out in those 10 communities, 25 per communities. And in four days, we were able to register 7,455 women. Those 7,455 would never have voted if we had not done those activities. So these were some of the things that we did. That we have a female president in Liberia. Is it a surprise? No. Because we had a whole population <laughs> of women who were conscientized and made aware that this is something that we need to do. We never imagined as we did the work that we did for peace and security in Liberia that we will be celebrated. I never imagined coming to Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, at a university called Villanova. I think the closest I would have ever come to this place was seeing the basketball team on TV. <laughs> we never really imagined that we would be celebrated in a documentary. We were clear in our heads that we had to be our own Mandela's. Everything we did in Liberia, we did for our survival and the survival of our children. Even as we celebrate the end of our wars, we have seen the emergence in our communities of new kinds of wars that we are determined to tackle with the same level that we did the civil conflict. Teen pregnancy, sexual abuse and exploitation of girls in school, teen prostitution, HIV and AIDS, harmful traditional practices are the major issues affecting our girls in our communities today. We are currently working from different angles to tackle some of these issues. Today in our work, we have projects to include girls in the space of leadership and active peace building, bringing their issues that have traditionally been discussed in the private sphere into the public domain making it difficult for any progress to be made without including the needs and priorities of women and girls. Immediately after the conflict, the female lawyers of Liberia got together, looking forward and looking at the whole issue of rape. They drafted a bill, sent it to parliament, and today Liberia has the strongest rape law in all of West Africa. Rape 
has no bill and is 12 to life if you found guilty. Previously, traditional marriages, women who went into traditional marriages never really got any form of property from their husbands. Today, as a result of the inheritance law, these women have claim to properties their husbands have given. The work is daunting, it's hard, but it's rewarding. As we continue to engage, we've also been engaging with the security sector, asking of security institutions how women are being treated and why are they not being promoted. We've also been working with community women, getting them to bring their issues to the table, speaking with political leaders, and making their issues a part of their national agenda. Last year, we were able to convene two interactive sessions with the president of Liberia and ordinary grassroots women. These women wanted to give her feedback on her national development agenda six years on. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. She came, I think, thinking, okay, with my Harvard degree, I can deal with these community women. We started at 10 in the morning. By 11, we had all of the cabinet ministers in the room because these women knew exactly what they wanted. We want to know what is the rotation, uh, um, what is the policy on rotation of police officers in communities. We want to know this, we want to know that, and obviously the president didn't have all of the issues on hand. First we got the justice minister in, then the police director, then the commerce minister, then the health minister, and before we knew it, those women were meeting with all of cabinet and requiring of them answer these questions that we've brought back from our communities. We've gotten to a place where we have a whole population of women who can't sit still. <laughs> we have a whole population of women who are involved in everything. And at some point we say we are constructively interfering in things that concerns us. <laughs> Not only are we working from within the space of Liberia, we've extended our work beyond the borders of other West African countries. In 2007, Sierra Leone was going to elections. There were issues of violence, there were issues of colors, there were issues of different things happening in Sierra Leone. We did something called the Liberian Women Peace Train to Sierra Leone. We took in 25 women, we traveled to every region of Sierra Leone and spoke to every political leader, telling them, we're watching you from across the border, you must have peaceful elections in this country. At the end of the elections, the current president sent an award to Liberia, crediting the Liberian women for their contribution to the peaceful elections. This year, March, we saw an uprising in Cote d'Ivoire. Seven women were killed, seven women a group of women who went to protest the war in Cote d'Ivoire were gone down. What did we do? We gathered women from Liberia, Ghana, Sierra Leone. As soon as we heard that the leaders of West Africa were meeting in Abuja, Nigeria. That was one of my favorite times. You would think that you've lost this team for protests and advocating after eight years. And then we go to Abuja and they have all of these security concerns that they have suicide bombers, and they have this and they have that, and we were determined to put a thousand women out to protest the death of the Ivorian women and to require of the West African leaders to speak with one voice on the issues that were going on in Cote d'Ivoire. We got to Nigeria that morning. We did all of our mobilization. We had one male partner, and he kept saying, never in the history of ECOWAS that is the economic community of West African states, have we had a gathering of the presidents and they've had ordinary people speak? Never. Never in the history have the heads of state added something on the agenda that wasn't pre-planned. Never. And he kept giving us never and never. <laughs> and never have we seen the Nigerian police give overnight clearance to people to protest, especially in these security times. Never. And we went on and on with the never and never and never. And then we finally said to him, we want to read a statement during the Heads of State Summit. Did you hear anything I told you? <laughs> never. <laughs> we were determined, as we were determined in Liberia, I, talk, I talk, turned to my mentor, Sugars, and said to her, Sugars, we have a tax on hand. 
pick up my phone, call Liberia, and said to the special assistant of the president, we need to speak to Madam President, we are in Abuja. And she said, well, she's coming, and I'll tell her to find time to meet you when she's in Abuja. That night, the president came, we stayed up till 3 a.m. The Sierra Leoneans were trying to get to the Sierra Leonean president. The Ghanaian women were trying to get to their vice president. So we're taking it from every angle. The next morning, we came back dead end. I went to the hall and said to Sugars that morning, as they were sitting delegates, they gave me a pass and said, sit in the hall. We had almost 300 women already gathered outside protesting. Sugars, let's go and find the president of Liberia. And she's like, Liban, where are we supposed to find her? I said, Sugars, I just don't know, but we'll find her. As we walk out, Nigeria Secret Service, as they call themselves, came to us and said, who's the leader of these women in peace, Bill, peace and... And I looked at Sugars and looked at myself and said, I have a mission. I'm not prepared to go to prison. And I said, this old lady is... <laughs> She turned and looked at me like, you invited me here, so she is the head. And the men, without even blinking, said, ma'am, follow us. But there was this female journalist that we brought from Liberia to cover the event, and this was her first time engaging with us. She just stood there looking at me like, you are such an evil person. I was like, Eva, let's go, we have a tax. <laughs> and then, like 10 minutes later, I started panicking, because when I called Sugar's phone, she's not picking calling her phone, she's not picking. And finally, my phone rings. Sugars is on the line. Lema, come on the seventh floor. I said, Sugars, where are you? Just come on the seventh floor. We get on the seventh floor, and they open this door, and Sugars is sitting on the breakfast table with the president of Liberia. <laughs> Sugars, how did you get here? Sit down and shut up. <laughs> so I sat down. And then she said, Madam President, Lima has something to say to you. So I said, Madam President, we need one minute just for the Ivorian women to make their statement. She said, one minute should be nothing. Call her foreign minister. Who, who are my allies? President Ward of Senegal, President Jonathan of Nigeria. But President Jonathan cannot say anything because he's the chairman. So she went, we went around President Chroma of Sierra Leone. Name all the presidents that were her allies and say, get their foreign ministers on the phone. I want to talk to their presidents. For the first time, women entered. For the first time, the agenda shifted. For the first time, we spoke at the Heads of State Summit. For the first time, Nigerian police gave us clearance the army gave us clearance, the special forces gave us clearance, and they provided protection for us for the first time. <laughs> this is just to give you a clear indication that when you are determined, determination, passion is what moves the world. We have seen, I have seen in this work that I do, from Congo to Liberia, to Cote d'Ivoire, to Ethiopia, to different countries on our continent. Powerful women, armed with nothing but their determination. The question I have for this community of people, what is staring you in your face? What are those issues in your communities? Are you looking and thinking, oh, I need to go to Africa to help? Are there problems in your backyard that you need to deal with? Are there social issues in these communities that you need to work with? Are you waiting for some political endorsement or some university endorsement or some funding? Do you have a passion that is causing you not to sleep at night and even when you try to close your eyes, you can't open your eyes? My challenge to this university family, to this community of people, there is a lot of good in humble beginnings. Never did we even imagine, not just with the mass action for peace, but with the work with the Ivorian women, with the work with the Congolese women, with the work with the little girls that we do in those rural communities, that we will see the kinds of success that we've seen. In my lifetime, I've seen what little can do for a whole community of people. 
I've seen what just making yourself available to a minority group, to a deprived group, to a hurting group can do for that group of people. I've seen, I've seen what even just waking up in the morning and having a smile on your face can do to a community of people. What can you do for your community? What are you doing and thinking that I'm doing nothing? I've encountered girls in this country who said to me, you know, I do this little work in my community and I don't think I'm making impact as you are making. I, I always admire King and Gandhi, Mandela, and I never really felt like I was doing anything and I'm doing anything close to what they're doing. But as I look back at the community of people that I continue to interact with, sometimes when I speak, I wish people could put my eyes on to see some of those women that I encountered 10 years ago who were in depressive, domestic violent relationship. I know one woman whose husband was a pastor. She has 13 children, all alive. She was never allowed to complete her education. And every time she said, I felt like I had some powers. But every time I tried to speak, my husband would turn to me and say, the wife of a pastor only pray. Go sit down and pray. After working with her for 10 years, today she sits on the President National Campaign Coordinating Team. She's one of the most powerful women in central Liberia. Men Women, boys, and girls who want political office confer with her. And she tells you, if I tell my people not to vote for you, they will not vote for you. She is so powerful. She's one person, last September, she was at the UN speaking her broken pigeon Liberian English about the power of mobilizing community women. We may never be Mandela's. You may never be a king. You may never be a Rosa Park. No one might ever recognize your work. You may come to school at Valanova and never get this award. But there is value in humble beginnings. I've seen it. I've tasted it. I've lived it. And whilst I appreciate all of these awards, but I always feel good going back to my humble beginning, the community where I can dance with the women, dance with the girls, talk about their issues, because that, for me, is where the actual work takes place. Join me. Join other women in the US. Join other people in this community and start your humble beginnings. With a humble beginning, you can definitely leave a legacy, no matter how small. Thank you.